You're someone with a vision for your practice, for your side hustle, and for your personal journey. But when it comes to establishing your path and how to get to where you want to be with your practice, things get a little messy. You're also someone who'd prefer to go in person instead of to groups and listening to everyone else's story. To me, it sounds like you could benefit from one-on-one consulting with our experienced practice of the practice consultants. From $5.95 a month and up, you can work with a consultant that will give you more direction and practical tried and tested tips matched to you and your goals. For more information, visit practiceofthepractice.com forward slash apply. Again, that's practiceofthepractice.com forward slash apply. This is the Practice of the Practice Podcast with Joe Sanok, session number 1013. I'm Joe Sanok, your host, and welcome to the Practice of the Practice Podcast, uh, where we are helping you build a thriving practice you absolutely love. Uh, You know, thriving can look different for each person. It can be financially thriving. It can be that you feel like you're doing really good transformational work. It can be um, just that you get to do the kind of work you want to do. Um, And we want you to absolutely love your practice. Uh, We want you to show up and be like, I can't believe I get to do this. I mean, today I'm doing four podcast interviews. I'm getting paid to talk to people. My report card when I was in elementary school, every single time said, Joey talks to his neighbors too much. And now I get paid for talking to my neighbors too much. So um, those things that are inside us sometimes come out in unique ways uh, as we grow into our careers. Um, You know, I'm really excited about today's episode. We're going to cover a lot of ground today, um, but it's a good kind of dovetail or follow up to our psychedelic assisted therapy series that we covered mostly in May. And we're going to be talking about transformation. We're going to talk about breath work. We're going to talk about uh, paths to integration. And our guest room and introduce in just a second. Actually, did a documentary on psychedelics a while ago before it was like a big thing um, to to be covering in the news. And so I'm really excited for you to meet Gio Bartolomeo, who is the driving force behind Elemental Rhythm Breathwork, a revolutionary approach to unlocking one's full potential through the power of breath. As the founder of Elemental Wellness in Toronto and co-founder of the Personal Development School, Gio is not only an entrepreneur, but a life adventurer with a passion for experiential learning. Gio, welcome to the Practice of the Practice podcast. Thanks, Joe. Um, It's it's a pleasure to be here. I'm super grateful uh, for the opportunities to share with you and your audience. And I will say, you know, um, 1,013 episodes, that, that's amazing. You know, and I think any practice consistency is like key. And just, you know, showing that through through your work is, is pretty awesome. And my birthday is on the 13th, so I'm glad I'm the 1,013th oh, episode. Love that. <laughs> that that's really cool. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's, it's funny when you when you stick with something and just keep at it. Um, you know, we now are doing four episodes a week and, you know, those those add up quickly. Uh, I want to start with, so transformation. When I asked you before we got rolling, you know, kind of some directions, one of the first words that you said was transformation. Um, Why does transformation matter to you? And I'd love for you to take us back kind of origin story style. Is there, is there something that happened to you or something that was kind of an inflection point where you realized you needed transformation or had an aha moment or like, you know, where does kind of your transformation journey begin? Yeah, uh, good question. You know, the more I, I contemplate on it, there there is like a lot of like different inflection points for different awarenesses that uh, I was receiving even before I even knew what self awareness was. But <clears throat> the main one um, that always comes to mind when I'm telling this story is like, you know, I was I grew up, you know, middle class, upper middle class area, ninety percent Italian background very competitive, keeping up with the Joneses, people are driving nice cars. And our family was definitely on the lower spectrum of that. And I was always taught that, you know, net worth and self-worth was the same thing. So in order to be anything, you had to make money, get a good job, you know, get good grades in school and, you know, do all these things. And so, you know, that kind of created the lens through which I was seeing my world. It was like competitive, trying to do well, wanting to make money, wanting to keep up. Um, and I realized pretty quickly that I wasn't going to be like a chartered accountant, like my dad wanted me to be. And, you know, um, I had good grades, but something was just like pushing me down this entrepreneurial path. And from an early age, I just was interested in business and trying to make money and did all kinds of crazy things that, um, were, had a lot of learning lessons in your time with them, a lot of 
a lot of highs, like really high highs, a lot of really low lows. And, you know, somewhere along the way, probably about, I'd say like 15-ish years ago, I remember sitting at the edge of my bed and it was kind of the first time I remember, well, at that time anyways, where it felt like something was speaking to me, almost like in a spiritual sense. And I wasn't, I didn't really believe in that stuff. Grew up a Catholic, prayed to Jesus, you know, did what I did and, you know, hope they would forgive me at the end of the week when, you know, it was time to go to church. Didn't go to church that often either. But I had this kind of like voice in my head and if it was my imagination or what. And I remember staring at my hands and I had this vision of these old wrinkly hands, like my grandfather was about 90 at the time. and the thought that came into my mind was like, Hey man, you're a clever guy. You figured out how to make some money. This is when I was finally starting to make a little bit of money. It wasn't rich by any means, but I was getting in the comfortable zone, had a house, was married, had two young kids or one young kid at the time. And it was like, yeah, you figured out how to, how to make some money and to do these things. And you're probably going to go on, do the same thing, go on your vacation each year, driving a decent car. And that's just going to go on and on. You're going to wake up one day and be old. 90 years old, waking up the same bed, and you look back and be like, what did I actually accomplish? Who cares? Like just this meaningless, meaningless life that I was living, you know, and I, I had a, so much to be grateful for. And I was grateful for all the things that I had. But when I looked at what I was doing, I automatically, for the first time, recognized what it felt like to be unfulfilled. And I realized that a lot of the pressure to keep myself busy was to kind of mask that feeling, this entrepreneur that was always jumping into these new things. So I had that new awareness and it was the first thing that I didn't really know how to solve. Like I was a really good problem solver when I came to business because things were tangible. They were right in front of my face and I could diagnose it, come up with some sort of solution. But an inward kind of feeling of unfulfillment, it's like, what, what do you do with that? And of course you do what most people do is they go Google search it, you know, what's the meaning of life? You know, what am I doing here? All that kind of stuff. Obviously didn't come up with an answer, but it started leading me down some rabbit holes of self-discovery. And I realized that I'd be living in, in somewhat of a bubble for most of my life and that I really need to make a significant change. And the word transformation didn't really have much meaning yet, but I was really excited to explore, you know, um, something different. And so that led me to reading like different philosophical texts, you know, uh, Stoic philosophy, Buddhist philosophy, the Bhagavad Gita, Hindu philosophy. Um, I started watching different YouTube videos and eventually, you know, it was Alan Watts video. I don't know if you're familiar with Alan Watts. Oh, Alan Watts. I knew I liked you, Gio. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, I've been going. So I have the Waking Up app uh, that Sam Harris created and it has the entire nice. Alan Watts collection in oh, it. Nice. And I like it's literally... Gosh, I think there's probably 20 sections and each one has probably eight hours in it. Um, oh, and wow. so I've just been slowly making my way through it. So sorry, which, which Alan Watts uh, video was it? Oh, there was a ton of them. There was a ton of them. So I started reading his books. Uh, I can't remember the specific video, but I remember like, and this is when I was starting to just understand what intuition was, listening to responses in my body where something would spark a curiosity and I'd be attracted to it. And I started realizing, okay, I need to follow this intuition. You know, something sparky, like when, when you're a kid, you know, something new and exciting. It's like you have this curiosity and you follow it. Where as we start getting conditioned in school and all these things, it's like you think a certain way, you do a certain thing, you kind of suppress your feelings, you turn off your creativity and you kind of like become, in most cases, you know, part of this, this cog in this wheel, you know, and it was kind of like just starting to break free from that. So just, okay, this is new. It's interesting. And the things he was saying and the perspectives that he was talking about coming from like a monotheistic Catholic upbringing was like something so refreshing, so different, opening my mind to possibility of, of just vibration and of yin and yang and positive and negative and fluidity versus, you know, a person who's saying these rules and, it was just like very interesting to try to even grasp. And I think a lot of the Buddhist texts, it's like, I think it's the, the Tao Te Ching that talks about in the first line is like, just putting this text into words loses the, ma the majority of its meaning. I'm paraphrasing there where mm -hmm. it's like these concepts that words are almost diminishing the actual translation of meaning of it. It was all very interesting and mystical stuff that made a lot of sense. But in one of those videos, there was a comment and I was like, I was scrolling the comments, which I love to do at the time. And this one just like jumped out of the screen. I mean, it's like, Hey, if you, if you like Alan Watts, you need to listen to Terrence McKenna. I was like, Oh, I've never mm. heard of this guy before. Is he like an author or a writer? Like, who is this guy? 
And if you don't know who Terrence McKenna is, you know, he was part of the counterculture culture movement, um, the 60s and I guess 70s of being a big proponent for the benefits of psychedelics and his own journey. Um, and I think he was, you know, traveled down to South America looking for magic mushrooms and then finding, stumbling upon ayahuasca. And he was also a poet and he shared in such interesting ways, some ideas he had were like way out there, but a lot of things he was saying was like really grabbing my attention. And so within a couple of weeks of diving into this and then a lot of synchronicities that are unexplainable, um, you know, I, I was pretty much convinced I got to go down to South America and find ayahuasca. And so I'd have a conversation with my wife and, you know, this is the first time ever even hearing of psychedelics in this context, probably like for me, 2012, I know it's been around way longer and most people have been using them. But for me, this was like, wait, you can, these things do these things. I thought they were all drugs and bad and, you know, you know, I'm picturing a fried egg on a pan from commercials growing up about, you know, it's your brain, it's your brain on drugs type stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I have to convince my wife now that I need to go on this journey down to the jungle to drink a psychedelic tea with some strangers. And that is something that's going to really help me. <laughs> She's like, are you completely <laughs> crazy? And I've been crazy most of my life. So after some good negotiation, I went and on that first cup of ayahuasca, my life changed like humbled to the degree of like thinking I knew a lot and thinking I was smart to realizing like my consciousness can't even comprehend a fraction of a percentage of what the consciousness in the universe is and what, what the reality of, of life is. And it was scary, but you know, I had a death experience too going through that. Um, but it was also exciting to know that I knew nothing you know, to know that I knew so little and, and it was opening me up to different possibilities of, of everything, you know, just like experiencing life, death and everything in between. Um, and so I came back and I realized, okay, I need to make some changes in my life. And, and that was like a uh, probably six month transformational process. It took me from what I would say, like being very asleep and unaware to having my mind cracked open completely and seeing the world in a completely different lens. And the thing that's interesting about transformation is I'd say with most of the people I work with and maybe all people in general, like nothing in the world has to change. It's your perspective. It's that lens through which you see the world is what changes. And those are really based on your beliefs, right? And a lot of times what psychedelics will do and other practices will do is a start getting to question your beliefs, where they come from, why do you have them? And a lot of our beliefs um come from childhood you know it's this it's this very kind of raw and fresh subconscious mind that's looking to survive in the world and different experiences that happen things we see we hear um things that happen to us um starts creating this protection mechanism about how to navigate this world to stay safe and stay in our comfort zone um and a lot of the growth and transformation obviously happens outside of that um, but I was starting to really see that and understand that and started mm. just dedicating a lot of my life to understanding that more, you know, and that's how I got into breath work. I met Wim Hof and started changing the people I was hanging around, not because I didn't like them anymore, but because I was looking for more. Like I was, I was interested in people that had different perspectives, you know, breaking out of that bubble, so to speak again, and just trying to understand other people. And what I also really tried to do was also try to understand people I disagree with. You know, people that trigger me, people that say things. Like, okay, like obviously if they're coming from that perspective, it's something I don't understand. So at least I should try to understand that before making up a decision. It's like, hey, you know, that that kind of judgment lens. It's like, how do I kind of um, transcend that or try to, which is so it's very hard to do, but just have more understanding. Yeah, I want to ask about when you came back. So at that time, you know, not a ton of resources with integration, not nearly you know, like where it is now where, you know, podcasters like myself are trying to dig into these things. How did your integration look when you came back and you have this experience, you know, you're not there you know, with your partner and um, like, was it messy? Was it good? Like what was helpful? What was harmful? Yeah, it was, it was so like, life was so different for me. So, you know, it, it was, it was challenging because you come from this like super high in this beautiful place and none of your environment is there to kind of trigger you to coming back to, you know, a lot of times what, what the environment that is created around you that brings you to that point of needing something like plant medicine or whatever else it is, you know, going back into that can be hard as well. So there was definitely challenges. Um, 
there was definitely a lot of challenges in, in that regard. But um, I just just dove into like learning. You know what I mean? I think that was always something that I was good at. It was like researching and finding out things. And I really wanted to tell everyone about Like I thought I had found the Holy Grail. I, I wanted to tell everyone that there's this thing that everyone needs to try and tell them about my experiences. And the expectation was everyone's like, yes, let's go. I'm in. And everyone just looked at me like I was completely crazy. And I was like, okay, like maybe this is something I, I shouldn't be screaming at the top of my lungs. Um, so I looked for people that were, were, were in that space. And to be honest, the reason I went to South America is because I thought there wasn't that culture that even existed around where I was. But now that I had this new awareness, it was almost like I could find them. You know what I mean? Like whether it was on Facebook, I could see their posts, feel their energy. And, and again, speaking in these terms, like six months before this experience, it was like a very rare thing. It was too woo, quote unquote woo woo for me. Mm-hmm. But I just started going to these different events and was meeting people and and trying to talk to them, get practice. Because I think the one of the biggest parts of integration is having a community that kind of understands you or that can support you. And mm. When I came back, I didn't have that because no one understood what happened. My wife didn't understand. My family thought I was crazy. And I had no one to really talk to in a way that I could really share because everyone I was sharing this with was like, man, you're crazy. That's insane. But like, no, thank you. Um, and that's where the idea for the documentary came where it was like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm trying to convince people that I found something. I realized like, there's at that point, I didn't know, but you cannot convince anyone to change. Like it has to come from. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So that was a, a really important learning. But I was doing all this research on like the history of psychedelics, where it's used around the world. I was looking at, you know, the scientific studies that they'd done on it. I was looking at uh, transformational stories, doctors that were kind of using it in the gray and, you know, underground market to heal people. And all of this evidence that was just pointing towards, wow, there is something really powerful here that people need to know about, kind of created this template for a documentary. Um, and then I was able to find actually people in Canada that were, you know, facilitating holding ceremonies. So this whole subculture that I didn't know existed was actually kind of there and had been kind of holding that line for probably since, since things went underground in, in the sixties and seventies. Um, so it was kind of like a figuring out process for me, but, but the good thing was, is like, I think it happened to me for a reason. Cause I was able to kind of use those problem solving skills that I had that couldn't figure out what fulfillment was, but to try to figure out, okay, like what are some of the practices that I need to do? And I got into like changing my diet. I got into, you know, um, meditation, breath work, um, started understanding more about like the subconscious mind, how it works. Um, and really just going deep into everything that was then on the fringe for me, as far as like alternative healing and, um, things that, you know, I was looking at anecdotal evidence of transformation and people changing. I was just curious about that. Yeah. Mm. I am so excited about Alma. When I had my private practice, I struggled building my caseload, attracting the right clients, managing the business side. And honestly, one of the reasons I didn't take insurance was it was so difficult to navigate. So many of my consulting clients deal with these problems as well, and almost supports clinicians in building rewarding private practices with simplified insurance credentialing in under 45 days, enhanced reimbursement rates, and guaranteed two-week payback, plus a free profile in their searchable, filterable directory, making it easy for clients who are the right fit for your practice to find you. Learn more about how Alma could support your private practice at helloalma.com forward slash Joe. That's hello, A-L-M-A dot com slash Joe to learn more. Now, how did that morph into kind of the business work that you do, like things around breath work and uh, yeah. kind of the teachings? And like, how did that go from just the personal, which, you know, those of us that have done the work may have had personal experiences and, you know, but aren't jumping into creating, you know, like a you know, breath work business or different trainings. Like how did that transformation happen for you? It was very organic, to be honest. Um, so, you know, I had that first awareness, felt unfulfilled. Every time I went into these businesses that I was doing, I just felt more and more dissonance, like getting into fights with, partners, coworkers, employees, just feeling on edge, agitated. 
And, you know, the old me was just like, put your head down and push through, you know, like just make it happen, work harder. But I was starting to feel into like, man, I, I, I don't think I want to do these things anymore. And I'm talking about in business that I'm super invested in, um, both with time and money, but just knowing ultimately my heart, like I'm not supposed to be doing this. Um, and so what happened was I, I kind of, um, it's a weird time in my life. This is like early 2017. I uh, was already into breathwork at this time. So this is like maybe five years, four or five years after the initial ayahuasca experience where I'd just been doing, going through my own path and ended up going to this Wim Hof uh, breathwork training. I became friends with Wim Hof. He invited me to a training. At the training, I had a, a crazy transformational experience. Um, I, like we can get into a second. But anyways, and I just started creating this community of just sharing and wanting to connect with people. And I felt like I needed just to create a space um, for that. And so I created a wellness center. And one thing that I, I, I've realized is that like everything in life can be looked at through a transformational lens. You know, all the things that are triggering you, creating challenges, um, create this opportunity for you to show up and to learn something about yourself. Um, mm. And this business was like that on steroids. Because the first thing I did was I got into a business I knew nothing about. It was an in-person business. We had float tanks, saunas, ice baths back in 2017. We're in an area I grew up, which was like probably the last area that was open to this kind of stuff. And once I launched that, I realized that I didn't know what I was doing. I went way over budget, um, way over time, and basically started to face my own fear of failure and what that meant, what that meant about me. And... And it took me through this this whole process um, of that. And as I was looking at that, I just really was like, okay, you know, I have to come back to what my intention was for this place. Because like I'm focusing so much on the fear of losing money and going bankrupt and all this stuff that I'm actually attracting that. I'm sure bringing that energy into my business. And I just want to focus on helping people and creating that space that I really needed, you know, five years ago when, when I was going through transformation. And as soon as I changed my mindset, everything in the business started to change. And we started becoming profitable you know just around the time when like uh end of 2019 so going into covid we, we just kind of turned profitable but what was happening what i realized later in reflection is like i was building this incredible community of people meeting people that the profit was not coming in dollars and cents it was coming in richness of experience and relationships and learning from people and networking and when I look back now, the two businesses that I'm super focused and dialed in on now are came because of that place. If it didn't exist, it was like this kind of thing that had to happen. And, you know, in that moment, in the first you know year, you know, I would have probably paid anything or done anything to go back a year and say, you know, just get me out of this. Let me start from scratch. I don't want to do this anymore. Like, I don't want to fail. I don't want to face all this stuff. But when I look back, it was it was so important that I went through that. And looking back on my life, all the hardest moments created these inflection points, like you mentioned, that pushed me in a different direction that were so necessary for where I am now. Mm. Now, I'm thinking about the therapists that are listening right now, you know, mostly masters, PhD in counseling, psychology, MFTs, all of that. I would love to think like talk through first kind of if they don't fully know what breathwork is just a like quick tutorial on that but mm -hmm. then what becoming a breathwork facilitator could do for their practice that they could do that maybe they're not doing now um, within the counseling sessions or in group sessions or new offerings um, so let's start with like what is breathwork how would you describe that to someone that isn't maybe they've heard of it but they're not super familiar with what it is yeah sure so breath work is like a blanket term, you know, it's like saying like math, you know, um, there's so many facets to it, right? So, you know, breath work typically comes from pranayama, which is the ancient yogic tradition, uh, one of the eight limbs of yoga. And the yogis back then could use breath work to manipulate their heart rate, to create, do all these kind of physiological things. And I guess even spiritual or meditative kind of things as well like slowing down now science is catching up seeing how breathing affects your brain waves how it affects your heart rate your heart rate variability your um blood pressure you know all these things right um and so it could be that breath work could be used for for, for performance it could be used for um stress like nsdr um yoga nidras and all the way into these deep transformational guided experiences which were kind of initially kind of made popular i'd say by um holotropic breathwork stan groff 
when psychedelics went underground, they started using breath work as a tool to continue their their studies and transformational practices. And um, what what that kind of is is like using cyclic rhythmic breathing for a certain amount of time, which will bring the body into this really elevated state where um, they can experience deep emotions, repress memories, have almost like a psychedelic experience, see colors and visions, states of euphoria. And, you know, based on my best understanding of what's happening in the body, you know, some people claim like DMT gets released, which I think is a possibility. But basically, when you over breathe, you're expelling carbon dioxide, you're expelling carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide is not a waste gas, it's actually really important for delivering oxygen to your, um, your cells and to your um, organs and your tissues. And so when you're expelling all this CO2, what happens is your brain starts getting starved of oxygen because your red blood cells are holding on to um, all the oxygen molecules because you don't have the carbon dioxide to deliver it. And they say you almost have a, this like this near death experience where you go to see euphoria, visions flash before your eyes, and all these kind of things. And they found it really helpful in um, therapy, um, and also did, did studies on safety. It's like I think it was eleven thousand patients that they studied over a ten year period with holotropic breathwork and found zero um, negative outcomes as far as like any danger any risk or anything like that as far as anyone getting hurt and all these positive side effects from it so improving your mood um snapping out of depression or anxiety we have so many anecdotal experiences from my own experience of like the craziest stories you can imagine um using breath work and creating transformation so a lot of research still needs to be done um and the pathways and mechanism how it works are still they're getting more and more understood as time goes on. The biggest problem with with breath work, from my perspective, is that no one's going to dump money to research unless they just want to know because there's no real sellable product there. You know, it's really hard to sell breath work. Um, but what I do know for sure is it will help you get better results with your clients, whether you're a coach or therapist, because um, there's mm-hmm. something about the rhythmic breathing that changes the brainwave states. So it changes the activity in the default mode network. And the mm-hmm. prefrontal cortex, where you know the uh, analytical mind kind of is active. They see the the ego lives there, where people do a lot of ruminating. It kind of shuts that down completely. It moves your brain waves from beta to alpha, maybe even theta, which is a much more suggestible state, and allows people to explore without the um, those protective walls of um, that part of your brain, which a lot of times is trying to stay in control and not let you go into these other areas. That's usually where a lot of our fears, traumas, beliefs are kind of situated. We bury them. Right. And it works the same with like psychedelics, you know, it's bringing these things to the surface that we can process them so we can change our perspective on them and hopefully eventually heal from them or change that narrative so that we no longer have to, um, be controlled by that. Every time, you know, something triggers that belief or that fear, you know, our body's going to respond to it. And we're going to try to either withdraw, fight, flight, you know, the response of the nervous system. <clears throat> so breath work, you know, we use it in a way so that we teach people how to guide people through these experiences using a specific process and some um, guided meditations that are specifically designed to help people go deeper within themselves and have self-awareness. And we've even created um, coaching programs that combine breath work and traditional coaching with some subconscious reprogramming that have been able to create like incredible transformations and results because we're trying to get to people down to that belief level. And, mm. you know, my partner, Thais, I'm not sure if she created this, um, but she taught this to me. It's like, you know, our perception of reality is experienced in layers in the mind. And the base layer is beliefs. So, you know, when we're born into this world, you know, we start creating beliefs about things. This is safe. This is not safe. I think we're born with like three fears, fear of loud noises, fear of falling and fear of abandonment. I think are the only three we're actually born with all the rest. We kind of like pick up. And so, you know, as we're going through life as a young kid, you know, like we're creating all these frameworks based on, again, like what we see, what we hear. And then it's thoughts. So something happens and based on what we believe, we create a thought about that. Is this good? Is this bad? Um, you know, what is the implication of this thing, this exper- this thing I'm experiencing? We think about it, but it's dictated by what we believe. And then after that is emotions. So Now, if your thought is this is good or bad or I'm afraid, now you feel it in your body. The body's responding to it. And finally, the last one is action or inaction. Are they going to fight? We're going to laugh. We're going to have an action towards this experience. But if we can 
you know, go back to the belief level and change that, it'll send this ripple effect through all of your thoughts, all of your emotions and all of your actions. And we've noticed that working with clients in the coaching space that, you know, if we can get them to identify like core belief, and there are about like 20 of them that, that almost all people have a few of them. Some of them have many of them. Once we start healing those core beliefs, you know, I'm abandoned, I'm alone, I'm not good enough, I'm unimportant, I'm unsafe, you, know, you name it. You know, the lens through which you see the world can change pretty rapidly. And I think this yeah. is kind of the shortcoming of integration with ayahuasca. You know, one aspect is the community. But one thing is like when we see a belief come up or an experience, what do we do with that? How do we integrate it? And the conscious mind cannot outwill the, the subconscious mind. It can't. It's just like the way we're built. That's why most New Year's resolutions fail. You know, people can will themselves for a week, maybe two, and then they kind of give up. If there's something in our subconscious mind that's contradicting that, like an unmet need or one of these core beliefs. So if we can help people to get awareness onto whether their needs are not getting met or they have a core belief or a limiting belief somewhere lodged deep inside them and they can start seeing it and make the change in real time, Man, the results are incredible. Well, Gio, the last question I always ask is if every private practitioner in the world were listening right now, what would you want them to know? What would I want them to know? Um, well, there's a few things. Like one is is the value of authenticity in the world and really just like um being yourself and setting that vibration that it's gonna attract the right people that um are gonna be able to get the most value from you. So really just sending out that strong signal and also, you know, just walking the walk. Like, you know, if you're saying things that your clients should be doing, it's like, are, are you doing your own personal journey of transformation or therapy or whatever it is that you're in? Because I know that they can feel that. And it's really, really important to, you know, do what you say and be lead by example um, and just don't be afraid to be yourself. And that's going to be the best way to connect with people. Um, when you can actually send off that vibration of who your true self and authentic self is. That's from my experience anyways, and it hasn't, mm -hmm. hasn't failed me yet. So awesome. Gio, if people want to connect with you, connect with your training program, where should we send them? Yeah, elementalrhythm.com, or they can check me out on Instagram at elementalgeo. Um, either way, you know, I'm pretty quick to respond, but the training program's on the website, and then through Instagram if you have any questions, or you can email us to the website. So awesome. Thank you so much for being on the Practice of the Practice podcast. Thank you, Joe. It's been a pleasure. You know, sometimes we, we go through certifications because we think that clients are going to you know, care if you're you know, just one step above or other things. But to me, the most important certifications and trainings are the ones that help you do more of the work that you want to do. Uh, and so if it's something like breath work and you want to incorporate that into retreats or group counseling or other things, you know, look into these kind of training programs um, to think about, you know, would that add, you know, a distinguishing uh, way that I offer my counseling services that's different from other people that would attract more of my ideal clients, would help me have more private pay people instead of just insurance based people. Um, like thinking through how are we changing and developing over time? Um, you know, even a few years ago, uh, I would have been nervous to do this psychedelic series um, to just say, this is something I'm interested in learning about. Uh, and to have that confidence to say, you know what, I'm learning publicly um, by interviewing a bunch of these people back in May. Um, and, you know, if that turns somebody off to me, at least I'm being my authentic self in regards to what I'm interested in. And those that want to come along for that ride, please come along. Uh, and those that, you know, find that offensive or whatever probably aren't my people and so the more that you can step into you know what is it you're interested in create that business create that dynamic so that you're attracting the kind of people that you absolutely absolutely love working with um, also, we could not do this show without our amazing sponsors. Uh, as you know, Alma has been a just crazy awesome sponsor this year. Uh, they help you in all the different areas in building your private practice. They know it can be challenging and growing your caseload, navigating insurance and managing billing and paperwork can take a lot of time. And that's why Alma gives clinicians the tools they need to build thriving private practices. They also get you credentialed in 45 days. I mean, that's insane. 
Um, we've been looking for someone like this for us to refer to. They can help people get credentialed, get you onto insurances, help manage those claim submissions, guarantee the payment within two weeks of the appointment. That's what Alma does. Uh, they are the best. You can check them out over at helloalma.com forward slash Joe. That's hello, A-L-M-A.com slash Joe to get started. Thank you so much for letting me into your ears and into your brain. Have an amazing day. I'll talk to you soon. Special thanks to the band Silence is Sexy for that intro music. And this podcast is designed to provide accurate and authoritative information in regard to the subject matter covered. It is given with the understanding that neither the host, the producers, the publishers, or guests are rendering legal, accounting, clinical, or other professional information. If you want a professional, you should find one.